It's time for another amazing chemistry video with Mr. Stapleton. Proudly sponsored by Farmer Junior Nice Coffee. Okay. Hi guys, welcome to this video which is about a periodic table. So we're going to be taking you through some of the trends. So let's start off by actually looking at just a basic outline of the periodic table as, such as what I've got here. Talk about how it's broken up. Okay. The periodic table is broken up into groups. Okay, so you can see here I'm outlining group two in the periodic table. Okay, these groups okay, are based upon the number of valence electrons in the outer shell. Okay, so everything in group two here all right, has two valence electrons. Okay, that's how we group them together. So we've got, I'm just going to change my color here, so I'm going to go to black. So we've got group one here, which has one valence electron. Group two has two valence electrons, and we come over here to group three. They all have three valence electrons, so three electrons around the shell, four, five, six, seven, and then group eight. Okay, That's how we separate um, into groups. The rows are called periods. Okay, So if we have a look at this group all the way across here, all right, this is period two. They're grouped into periods based upon the number of electron shells that they have. Okay, so everything in period two has two electron shells. Okay, um, so that's pretty much why we group them together the way we do. So what? Hopefully that's not new to you guys. But what we're going to look at is some of these trends and what information you can get from the periodic table. Well, the first thing you can generally get is the charge, and we often refer to this sometimes as the oxidation number as well. Okay. So I'm going to be focusing on group 2 a fair bit here over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put plus 2 here. Okay, Because there's two electrons in the outer shell, group 2 um, wants to lose two electrons to gain a full outer shell below. Okay, So you get a plus 2 charge for the iron. That's also what we call the oxidation number. So when you were looking at writing formulae or doing half equations with redox, you can come back to the periodic table really quickly, find the element, Whatever group it's in, that's basically going to be able to tell you what the oxidation number is. So over here in group 1, oxidation number is plus 1. Or the charge we normally find is plus 1, plus 2. All right. Over here, plus 3 for group 3 and plus 4. It's a lot easier to actually lose 4 electrons than it is to gain 4 electrons. So that's why group 4, even though it could go both ways to get a full out of shell, it normally loses and gets a plus 4 charge. Once we get over here to nitrogen, now we've got 5 electrons in the outer shell. That means it's going to be more favourable to actually gain three electrons rather than lose five. So our charge or oxidation number here is going to be minus three, minus two, minus one. Okay. This group over here is what we call the noble gases. Okay. The noble gases already all have a full outer shell. So their charge is going to be zero and their oxidation number will always be zero as well. Okay. talked about a couple of groups, so let me just quickly highlight some of the main ones that you need to know. <clears throat> okay, If I come over here to another one of my periodic tables, this one you see I've split up into what are called metal, metalloids and non-metals. Okay? So everything that has this silver colour here, that's a metal. Okay, So you can see there's lots and lots of metals all the way through. And it shouldn't surprise us, we know that group 1 and metal, group 2 are metals. Okay? And we've got transition metals through here as well. Okay? We come over here to what we call metalloids. Now metalloids have the characteristics or properties of both metals and non-metals. Okay? And then we come over here to our non-metal atoms. Okay? If we go to another one, this one's going to show us some of the what we call blocks of the periodic table. And this relates to their subshells that they have or their um, electronic configuration. And hopefully this is nothing new to you either. Okay, so when we look over here at groups one and two, okay, groups one and two here, um, they are actually known as the S block because they their highest energy orbital is an S block. All right, so one S two here, two S two, three S two, four S two, five S two, six S two, seven S two is their highest ones. Okay, over the other side, the non-metals. Okay, we've got all of this group here, these are all okay. The D, uh, the, the sorry, the P block because their highest orbital is the P. All 
Alright, so you've got 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, so on. Okay. The group we've had in the middle here, this pink group, I actually need to make my brush a little bit bigger for you, sorry guys. Okay. Um, this group we've got in the middle here is what we call our transition metals. Okay. Our transition metals through here. Okay. They're called transition metals because they basically bridge the gap between the metals and the non-metals, if you remember the previous one I showed you. So they transition over. All of these are in what we call the D block. These all have a, a D subshell. So we've got 3D, 4D, 5D. Okay. And then this group right down the bottom, okay, which is the green one here, um, are what we call the lanthanides and actinides. Okay. Um, they're the F block. We don't really worry too much about them, but they all have an F orbital. They're getting quite high in terms of their electron configuration. So what I actually want to do is come back to my initial periodic table over here. And we talked about um, where the S, P, D, and F blocks are. Some of the uh, groups that you'll need to know. Group 1 over here. So I'll go back to red. Group 1 over here. All right. All the way from hydrogen down to francium. Okay. Are called the alkali metals. Okay. Alkali is a term we use to mean water soluble base. So they're the alkali earth, they're the alkali metals. Because any of these hydrogen, lithium, sodium, anytime you dissolve them in water, okay, we get a alkaline or a basic solution. So because they dissolve in water, it's called alkali. Group two, alright, over here, and I'll go to blue this time. So group two here are called the alkaline, alright, earth metals. Okay? Same sort of thing, they give us basic, I'm sorry for my writing there, but they, they give us basic solutions when they dissolve in water, and they're commonly found combined with other elements in the earth. Okay. If we look in the middle, we've talked about the transition metals. Okay. So this group all through here, transition metals. Okay. And then coming over to this side, there's only really two other groups you need to know. First one is this group here, which is group seven. Starting with fluorine, okay. Those are the halogens, okay. Very, very reactive, all right. And then the final group right here on the end, these ones here are what we call the noble gases, okay. So they're the noble gases. Sometimes, though, we also refer to these as the inert gases, okay. Because they have a full outer shell, they don't react. So, let's have a quick look at some trends in the periodic table. Well, not surprisingly, if we come back to um, this periodic table that we had in the middle here with the metals, all right, if we want to look at some trends in the periodic table, okay, metallic character as we go from this way, and I'm going to rotate this around, sorry, if it will let me, so I'm going to rotate it um, 90 degrees, and go Rotate it again, 180. There we go. So as we go across the periodic table, okay, not surprisingly, our metallic character decreases. Okay, we go from metals to non-metals. All right. The reason for that is we've got one electron in the outer shell here, seven electrons over here. A metal wants to lose electrons. Okay. So lithium will very, very readily lose one electron, whereas fluorine will much more readily gain one electron, which is the property of a non-metal. Okay. If we get rid of that, okay, all right, and we want to look at some other trends, okay, we'll come back to just that initial basic one, all right. Let's look at some trends in electronegativity. Now, electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electron density to itself in a bond, okay. So, if we look going across the periodic table like this, all right, I'm going to deliberately draw it towards fluorine there, okay, and I'm also going to go towards fluorine as well, okay? Because when we're looking at electronegativity, everything goes towards fluorine. That's the most electronegative element because it's got a very, very um, small atomic radius, okay? So it's got uh, um, only two shells. It can very readily don't, um, sorry, attract electrons towards itself, so that's the most electronegative. If you remember, fluorine is the most electronegative over here, okay? And then we come down here to... If I come back to my brush tool, um, if I come back here to francium, all right, that's the most reactive metal. All right, 
and therefore by default obviously because of the trans bacteria in the table it's probably the least reactive uh, so at least the electronegative element as well but it's the most reactive metal it's very very willing to give up an electron fluorine is very very ready to accept one okay that's electronegativity uh, trans okay if we look at oxide character okay so again what we're going to do is we're going to look going across the periodic table like this okay i'm just going to move that down a little bit for our trend okay over here all our metal oxides are basic okay so when you dissolve them in water they'll form basic oxides move your way across here right? and an easy way to remember that is something like sodium you can have a base such as sodium hydroxide okay that's an easy way to remember that, that oxides of metal are basic come all the way across this side you can think of something like um, sulfuric acid h2so4 sorry not easy to draw with a mouse right h2so4 these are all acidic so let's make this a bit bigger so i can write over the top so these are acidic oxides over here so if you try and remember things you use in the lab you be able to remember the trends but what happens if we go from the middle over to this side well you can get some things here like aluminium like zinc okay so aluminium oxide al 2 3 is actually what we call amphoteric okay an amphoteric substance is one that can react with both acids and bases. So aluminium oxide will actually react with an acid to form aluminium ions. It will react with a base to form aluminate ions. It reacts with both. So that's what we call amphoteric. So our oxide character goes from basic to amphoteric to acidic across the periodic table. Okay. Last ones I'm going to show you are just in terms of reactivity. Okay. If anyone knows a quick way to clear everything off of this, please feel free to let me know. I'm just going to get rid of all of these. So it's actually going to get rid of all of them. So um, what I'm going to do, just right bear with me for a second. Back up here, reload this one. And the last thing I'm going to show you is metal reactivity. Okay. So as we come down a group here, so if I actually look at our trend going down a group for metals okay as we go down a group uh, atomic radius increases so the electrons are further away from the nucleus which is what attracts them okay that means the electrons are far more easily gotten rid of okay so francium down here as i said before is our most reactive metal okay because it most readily gets rid of an electron okay conversely if we look over here at our non-metals Again, non-metals want to attract electrons, and this is kind of related to electronegativity. Fluorine is the most reactive um, non-metal because it has a very small, uh, as I said, atomic radius, easily attracts electrons to itself, so it's quite reactive as well. If you ever get stuck where you've got two that are close, so let's say we wanted to have a look at nitrogen, sorry, let me get rid of the arrows and come my brushes. Okay, so if we want to have a look at nitrogen nitrogen and you want to compare that to sulfur okay basically you've got to look at how close they are to fluorine but you've also got to have a look at basically atomic radius versus um, the number of electrons that has or sorry number of protons in the nucleus so here we've got nitrogen smaller electron shell okay then sulfur so that's got three electron shells this has got two electron shells, so it's a smaller atomic radius for nitrogen. That means it's going to be more readily able to accept electrons to itself. So nitrogen is probably going to be slightly more electronegative than sulfur. They're pretty close. Okay. If you were definitely looking at nitrogen and phosphorus, you could easily say nitrogen was. So because they're reasonably close, all right, this has got more protons in its nucleus, it's going to still be nitrogen slightly because it's got a smaller atomic radius. So hopefully that helps. If you've got any more questions, guys, just let me know. Thanks.